Today we're going to be talking about Yusuko Silver and some of the most common topics inside Yusuko Silver. So the things we're going to go over today are going to be about uh, prefix sums, um, graph traversals in general, so BFS, DFS, stuff like that, like flood fill, stuff like that. And the third topic that we're going to go through, well, not in order, but uh, the third topic is binary search. So, um, so uh, if you wanted to talk about some more complex silver topics like uh, sweep line or like two pointers or something like that, you can just ask and then I'll just briefly go over the main idea behind those topics um, after we're done with the presentation. But if not, then um, yeah, we can just listen to the, the presentation. So the first topic is graph traversal. So graph traversal can be done in a variety of ways, but the only way that you need to know for silver is BFS and DFS. So how do you traverse a graph? Well, of course, it's BFS and DFS. DFS is known as depth first search because it searches deep first before it searches breadth. Uh, I'll get into what that means later, but essentially it use, utilizes recursion to travel through one ver vertex. And once it travels through one vertex, it's essentially the same as traveling through another vertex because um, they're, you're doing the same operations just on different vertices. Um, BFS is kind of similar, but it's short for breadth first search. So it searches wide instead of into one rabbit hole. And it also utilizes a queue to traverse through the graph rather than recursion. Generally, DFS would be much easier to implement than, BF, uh, than BFS, but BFS is faster just because its search structure is a bit more, um, it's a bit more efficient. And also uh, recursion is very, very slow. So the constant factor that you get by not using recursion is always going to, of course, make your code faster. So um, yeah, BFS can also be used um, uh, for things other than what DFS can do. So BFS can be useful for finding the shortest path in an unweighted graph. It can be useful for a lot of different things, but um, yeah. Um, generally, I'm not certain about this, but uh, BFS is a, a bit harder than the scope of silver, but a lot of silver problems that might be hard to solve without BFS uh, can be solved really easily with BFS. So uh, just keep that in mind. So it might be a little bit, just a tiny bit beyond the scope of silver, but um, it's really good to know. And uh, most silver people would know BFS anyways, because it's so similar to DFS anyways. Uh, so DFS, the idea is to essentially figure out how to traverse each node. So the idea is to visit a node. Basically, when you visit a node, you mark the node as visited and find what we want to find at the node. Like, for example, you might want to find the parent, you might want to find the depth, like how far away it is. You might want to find um, what component is in, because sometimes that's important. And stuff like that. So that might be something you want to find. Another thing you want to find could be, um, or actually another thing you want to, uh, uh, another thing you want to find could be something like, uh, something like the number of nodes in its subtree or something like that. But generally there's a lot of things that you would want to find and you would basically find all of those things when you visit the node. The next thing you do is you list all possible new nodes that you can go to. So for example, um, let's draw a tree real quick. So here you could have this or a graph. So let's say this is your graph. And the idea here is to, let's say you're going to this node. Um, the idea is to, you wanna list all the possible nodes that you can go to. So the nodes that share an edge with this vertex that you want to go to. Um, everyone here, I assume knows how to write adjacency lists, adjacency matrix, stuff like that. 
So um, with DFS, if you have an adjacency matrix, if you just have like a matrix of like, oh, it's adjacent one, if it's not adjacent, it's zero, uh, zero, zero, dot, 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 whatever, right? If you have this, then when you're at this node, you'd have to check all of the numbers in the row and figure out which ones are one. And that takes too much time. So we really don't wanna use adjacency matrices. matrices. What we do want to know is we do want to use an adjacency list. So let's number these nodes real quick. Uh, six, seven, eight. So an adjacency list would be listing all of the nodes that one can go to. So the adjacency list, which I usually use a DJ, most people do that, but some people may do something else. The adjacency list of something is basically the um, it's basically all of the nodes that it can go to. So here it can go to two or three. So here it would just be two, three. Sometimes, like uh, here, the adjacency list could be very big. So for adjacency list of adjacency list of uh, adjacency list of three equals to um, equals to one, two, five and six. So yeah, that's what an adjacency list is. And so we list all the possible nodes that we can go to and um, uh, and we would basically want to go to all of the nodes that we haven't visited so far. So um, yeah, and then we visit all of the nodes that we haven't visited so far and we can recurse over those. So if we go, if we start at one, and then we go to two and three. One would be marked as visited, and then we would recursively visit two and three. So when we visit two, we would recursively visit four, and then we would mark this as one. And then after we visit four, mark this as one. Then we would recursively visit three, and then uh, so on and so forth until we visited every node. And once we visited every node, that means that we're done because we visited every node, right? So um, this can be useful for many different things, but um, the first thing is you wanna find the number of connected components in a graph. And the second thing is um, trees. Trees generally do not care whether you're using BFS or DFS um, because when you're using DFS or BFS, you're searching all the nodes in the same way. Uh, we'll get into the search structure a bit later, but essentially DFS and BFS, the edges that you're using to search are gonna be different in a general graph, but in a tree, they're gonna be the same. So using DFS, you can just do a lot of really cool operations with trees that you can also do with BFS, but DFS is just so much easier to code that people usually just use um, people use DFS instead, usually. So, um, yeah. Um, the other algorithm, of course, we've mentioned it, is BFS. Uh, okay. BFS is very similar in terms of its idea, except in its execution, it's a bit different. So instead of using recursion, basically it keeps a queue containing all of the nodes that we have we are going to process, but we have yet to process. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say we have a similar graph. Let's try to draw the same graph. Uh, here. Let's say we have a graph like this, and then we have the nodes labeled the same way. So the idea is that we want to put all of the nodes into the queue that we have yet to process, but we want to process later. 
or we know we're going to process in that order. So essentially, what do I mean? So at the start, you put any random node into the queue, let's say it's one. And then after you get one out, you visit one. So you visit, so visit one, you take one out of the queue. So then it gets erased. And then you add all of the nodes that are adjacent to one to the queue. So you add two and three to the queue. And then you take the first one out. So you take the first one out and then you visit it. So visit two. And then you figure out, well, two is adjacent to three and four, but three is already added. So we're only gonna add four. And then you do this until you visit all the nodes. And um, this is very similar to DFS. It can do everything that DFS can do and a bit more because with BFS, uh, there's a cool property actually that you can um, take advantage of. So if you look at the first element versus the last element in the DFS, um, so if you look at the first element of the DFS and compare, uh, actually, this is not good. Uh, you basically want to compare the first, the depth of the first element to the depth of the last element. So uh, for example, if you have this, three is the first element and four is the last element. Notice that the depth is at most one different and that these are in sorted order. Well, it's actually not that hard to prove that these would be in a sorted order because um, let's say you have a node A, which has depth D1, which is the first node, and then a depth, a node B, which has a depth D1 plus one, or D1 plus one, or uh, actually, uh, D2. Let's say that um, you have a node C, which has depth, depth of C, which is less than or greater than A and less than B, or greater than A and less than B, and it's not inside the queue. Then what happens with C? Well, um, if A is within the queue, or if B is within the queue, that means that everything with depth less than or equal to D2 has been uh, has been vi either visited or is either in the is either visited or in the queue. This is because um, in order to have visited a node of depth D2, that means that every node before it must have been visited. So every node with depth D2 minus one or, or less has been visited. That means that either C is visited, which is impossible if A hasn't been visited yet, or C is not visited. So that means that C isn't visited, but because A, um, but because A has depth less than or equal to C, that means that C must be in the, inside the queue. So um, every node that has, um, so every node that has been visited is always less than the largest node in the queue. And also that the queue is sorted at all times. And also that the depth difference between the maximum depth in the queue and the minimum depth is one. So there are a lot of cute, cute properties uh, that DFS can use and the biggest property that we can utilize BFS for is that um, BFS can find the shortest path between nodes in an unweighted graph. And the reason why this is possible is um, it essentially has to do everything with the properties of the queue. If the queue is completely sorted, that means that we already know what the shortest path from uh, the node the, the node that we're looking for to the uh, or the root node to the node that we're processing is. And if we know that shortest path, then we can update the shortest path for all of the nodes that we're going to visit. And so uh, and so you can just do it that way. Um, yeah. So the differences between BFS and DFS are mainly in terms of search structure and in terms of um, you know, in terms of how fast it is. BFS is generally faster than 
DFS, which I've said a bunch of times already, but it doesn't require, uh, but BFS, uh, DFS doesn't require uh, using a data structure to store all of the unused nodes. And it's generally way, just way easier to code. So if you're, um, if you think both BFS and DFS can solve a problem, um, generally implementing DFS is better because it's faster to code. You won't have to use as many, um, you won't have to use as many, um, as much time trying to code it. Um, the search structure is also very different. So I'll try to illustrate the search structure again. So let's say you have a very simple graph. Like this. The way DFS will go is um, it'll start with this node and then it'll go all the way down one rabbit hole. And then it'll go all the way around the cycle and then And then it'll go all the way down the cycle. And then after it's gone all the way down the rabbit hole, it'll come back and then it'll see the way that you, you actually do it. Whereas with B or with DFS or BFS, uh, if you have a similar cycle, it'll consider nodes one by one. So, so if you start over here, it'll go from here and then it'll go down this one, and it, then this one, and then it'll go down this one, and then this one. And then it'll go down this one, and it'll go down this one. And so if you're trying to have a spanning tree or something like that, BFS will give you a much more balanced, a much more even spanning tree, where every, um, if you think about it, every branch of the spanning tree will have a similar amount of nodes and stuff, stuff something like that. However, with BFS, or I mean with DFS, um, you'll have a giant branch and then really small branches afterwards because it'll just go down one rabbit hole really far down and then it'll only figure, figure out the leftovers after you've finished going through the giant rabbit hole. So they're very different in terms of search structure and the way BFS, the way the BFS just search structure works, it's that it gets to uh, go to every node in a more efficient way, uh, in a more efficient manner than DFS. So BFS is generally going to be slightly faster. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, here's an explanation of that. But yeah. Um, one of the most common utilizations of BFS or flood fill, or BFS or DFS, is flood fill. Flood fill is just a way to find the number of connected components of the graph. But not only find the number of connected components of the graph, you can also find like, um, as you'll see in one of the practice problems, but it can also find interesting properties of those connected components. Like um, in the practice problem, it'll give you a graph and um, you wanna find the perimeter of the graph. And um, you can do that with flood fill by um, just figuring out how much each node contributes to the final answer. But the idea behind flood fill is essentially just go through every single node and then um, and then run a DFS starting at every node that hasn't been visited. So the idea is, let's say you have a bunch of nodes, but they're only connected like this. Uh, let's say you have another one here and another one here. And then they're only connected like this. If you run a DFS starting from this node, you'll only be able to visit these two nodes. You won't be able to visit anything beyond the first two nodes because there are no edges connecting them. Then if you visit this node, you'll only be able to visit these three nodes. So in order to visit every single node and figure out the properties of each connected component, you want to run a, a flood fill. You start at each node that you haven't visited, and then you visit all of the components in each node or all the nodes in each component. And then you do that again and again until every node has been visited. This way, 
you can figure out very cool properties of connected components, like the size of each connected component, like for example, the perimeter, the area or whatever. And um, it's just very useful in general. And one especially common use of flood fill is to be used on a grid. So a lot of problems will require you to find something on a grid. Like for example, they'll have a grid, they'll shade in some parts of it, and you have to find the area of each component or the area or whatever of something. The way you solve this would be to visualize the graph or the grid as a graph. So if you have a grid and then it only wants you to find the connected components each shaded area. Let's say you shaded these areas. One way you can find the connected components are you can view this grid as a graph. The edges of the graph are the edges between connected or between filled in nodes. And so your resulting graph would look something like this. And then after you have this graph, you can run a flood fill on the graph to figure out some really interesting properties of the graph. So, uh, yeah. So here's the first practice problem. Um, uh, read it for like five minutes maybe, and then, um, yeah, try to come up with a solution before we go over it. Uh, you can like message me any ideas or anything. Hmm. Maybe this problem is a bit hard, but let me make sure it's the right problem. Yeah, it's the right problem. Hmm. Uh, okay, so I'll just try to explain the solution as well as I can. But essentially, you'll notice that n is less than or equal to uh, 5,000 and Q is less than or equal to 5,000. That means that um, we can just solve it for each query. If we can solve it in O of N for each query, then we can solve the whole problem in O of N Q, which runs in time. So how do we do it for each query? Well, uh, the idea, let's, okay, so, uh, so the idea is to um, the idea is to basically figure out whether an edge is valid for each query. So if an edge is valid, then you can traverse it, and we can tell if it's valid if r is greater than or equal to k of i. Basically, whether um, our uh, we can go through that edge if it still allows us. To have the to have it connected by at least k, and then after that, what we can do is we can just uh, yeah we can just solve the problem. So uh, we can just go with like for example, uh, I'm going to use a plus. If we have like something like this. And then let's say two, two, three, three, three. And then uh, let's say ki equals to three. 
then these edges, we can no longer traverse. Okay, so these edges, we can no longer traverse these edges because if we traverse them, then the minimum, uh, minimum, like connected, uh, minimum like connectivity between them is going to be this number, which is less than ki. So we can't go through those edges. But as long as all of the edges that we go through are greater than or equal to ki, no matter what, our path is going to work. And so we can just start at this. Uh, let's say we start at the vertex they're giving you. And then you can just count the number of vertices you can go to, and that will just be your answer. So in this case, it'll be four because you can go to four different vertices from this vertex. So you can just run a DFS or a BFS or anything like that on this vertex, and then you can figure out the maximum number of nodes that we can get. Um, and we can do this for each query again because n and k uh, n and q are both less than or equal to 5000 and because they're less than or equal to 5000 then it will run in time because n times q which is 5000 times 5000 is around uh 2.5 times 10 to the uh, 7 and 2.5 times 10 to the 7 is sufficiently less than 5 times 10 to the 8 so you can do this Um, okay, uh, if there are no, like, questions about the solution, we can move on to the next question. Um, okay, uh, if no one's gonna send me any messages, um, I might as well just go through this right now. Uh, so the idea behind this problem is, again, to turn your grid into a graph. And so uh, you want to use flood fill to figure out the area and perimeter of the graph. Well, how would that work? Well, let's say that we have a grid. And then we wanted to find like the, okay, so let's fill in some of these. Let's say we wanted to find the perimeter of the maximum component and the area of the maximum component. Well, how would we find the area? Well, the area is just by definition, the number of filled in vertices inside the connected component. So, for the area, it would just be really easy. It would just be the number of com number of nodes in that component. But the perimeter is a bit more tricky because it's kind of hard to figure out, well, how many edges does board borders this? And well, how do I do that? Well, the way you want to try to approach this problem is to try to break down the perimeter into its components. You want to figure out what does each node contribute to the perimeter? Well, let's consider this node, this node over here. What does this node contribute to the perimeter? Well, it contributes to the perimeter each side that is um, each side, the, each side of the node, which is uh, which is connected to something that isn't a node. So, for example, it's connected to this, but it's not connected to this, and it's not connected to this, and it's not connected to this. So you care about the number of things that it isn't connected to, which is three. So this node would contribute three to your perimeter. But this node, because it's connected to this, but it's not connected to this, and it's not connected to this, will contribute two to the perimeter. And so if we do this for every single node, then we can figure out what the total perimeter is. And um, once we're able to do that, we can just find the maximum of all of that, and that's just the solution. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Um, shouldn't be too hard to solve, but um, yeah. Um, okay, if there are no more questions about this, then let's go on to the next topic, which is binary search. So, uh, okay. 
Uh, I hope most people know what binary search is, but uh, in summary, binary search is just an algorithm which can efficiently search through a sorted array. And the idea is that like, let's say you have an array, you have an array, which is sorted. And then you basically, every time you search, you wanna have the search space. So when you search, you wanna figure out what the middle number is. Let's say the middle number is M. Then if your required value, which is X, if your X is less than M, if X is less than M, then that means that your uh, value is going to be in the left half. And if X is greater than M, then your required value is going to be in the right half. And if we can narrow down the search space by a factor of two every time we do one operation, then we can do the whole thing in O of log N operations. And so that's basically the key idea behind uh, binary search. And uh, uh, yeah, and it's fairly easy to code, I hope. Most of you know this already, but um, yeah, it has many applications um, and the ways in which binary search is used is very, very clever and requires a lot of uh, thinking to figure out how to use binary search in a lot of cases. So the most obvious case is of course, finding a certain element in a sorted array. If you find a certain element in a sorted array, well, of course, binary search, that's what's designed to do. But it can also be used to binary search for the answer. What do I mean by that? Let's say that, uh, okay, let's say that it's really easy to figure out whether an answer works and an answer would work, uh, okay. Let's say it's really easy to figure out whether an answer would work. So we have an array of our possible answer space. So this is our, answer space. Then what we can do is, uh, let's say our answer space looks like this. Um, zero, zero means doesn't work. And one means works. Then we can do something like this. So if you have your answer space looks like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, then you can use binary search to solve this. Well, it doesn't look that solvable, but how do you solve this? Well, again, you use binary search. You split it in half. And let's say the middle value, which is this value, is a 1. So now that the middle value is a one, then, um, then essentially you can just uh, say, oh, well, that means everything here is one. So everything is one. And then you only need to search over here because your answer would be the smallest one. And then, you search over here, well, you find the middle, then this is zero, so this is all zero. And then you go over here, you split it in half. This is zero, so this is all zero. And then soon enough, you'll narrow it down to your actual answer. So this is zero, this doesn't work. And then you find the actual answer. And this is one way where you can use binary search in a question that seemingly doesn't have anything to do with arrays, much less sorted arrays, but if you can easily figure out whether an answer works and you can prove a condition of monotonicity where if an answer works, then all of the answers above it work. And if an answer doesn't work, then all the answers below it won't work. Then you can use binary search to find the answer to the problem. And um, yeah, this is a very powerful technique. And it's a technique that if you haven't seen before, you'd never be able to solve the problem before. So um, yeah, it's a very powerful technique. Uh, yeah, so let's move on to a practice problem. Um, 
Here's the link. Um, yeah, this is supposed to be a more interactive kind of lecture, but um, it seems like no one wants to talk to me today, so. Yeah, I mean, I could just talk to nobody the whole time, but it would be much more fun and you would learn a lot more if you, you know, talk to me a bit about, you know, anything. Wait, wasn't Alvin in the bronze class? He was talking to me a lot. Why isn't he talking to me now? Hmm. Oh, well. Anyways. Does anyone have any ideas about this problem? Like, like, of course, you would want to use binary search because you know it's in a binary search lecture. It's part of the binary search slides. But think about how you would think of using binary search besides, you know, seeing that it's in the problem or it's in the lecture. Okay, I guess there's no point in trying to wait for people to talk to me. So um, yeah, I'll just explain the solution to this problem. So the solution is to realize that, well, there isn't a really good way to directly calculate the answer. If you try to think hard enough about how to directly calculate the answer, it's really hard to determine, well, how many, how many, how many cows do we go through? How many, how like how many cows do we take with each bus? And okay, well, if we take this, if we take this, how do we know it's optimal? And a lot of things like that. So that will probably not work. Let's try to use the idea we learned. Uh, oh, hmm. I don't think that'll work. And the reason I don't think that'll work is because. Um, or let's, so uh, I don't think that works because if you think about what the problem is doing is, uh, well, first, of course, you wanna sort in increasing order, but then you have M buses. So if you find the difference between the first and the seeth cow, that's only if you have one bus, then you could do that. But if you have multiple buses, it might be optimal to play something here. And so the first cow would go wait this much time. And then the second cow would wait this much time. And you would basically want to calculate this plus this. Um, yeah. So, okay, so the idea behind this problem is that it's actually really hard to determine, again, as I said, where you want to put all the buses. So what you want to do is, instead of determining where to put all of your buses, what if you determine what the maximum, what the maximum, uh, what the maximum wait time is? And then after you determine the maximum wait time, then you determine whether it's possible to get that wait time. So let's first solve that. How is it, how do we determine whether it's possible to solve that wait time? Well, let's say you're given this. Let's say it's one, two, five, six, seven, 10, 11, 12. And the wait time we want is two and we have three buses. So what we can do is we can, basically we have to take every single cow. So we take the first cow because it must be part of a bus. And we know that the bus must be at most. Uh, so the thing we're querying about is two. We know that the bus must be at most one plus two, which is three. We know that the bus must appear at, at most three. So if we have the bus appear over here, because that's 
where three is, then it'll take all of these, which is one and two, and then we'll be done with those and we can remove it. So we've used one bus and we've gotten rid of one, two, three. And then now we can do another bus, start at the first cow, do that plus two at seven. Then we can get rid of all of these. Then we can start at 10, then get to 12, and then get rid of all of these. And once you've used M buses, you can check whether there are cows remaining. If there are cows remaining, then it doesn't work. If there aren't cows remaining, then it does work. And so um, you can now have a way to check whether your answer works. And the way you can check whether your answer, uh, whether, um, the way you can check uh, whether like, it, like what your answer actually is based on binary search is, uh, remember the condition, your answer must be monotonically increasing. What does that mean? Well, first your answer must not work. So it must be zero, 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 zero. And then at some point it must start working. And then after it starts working, everything else must work as well. So <clears throat> the way we can prove this is actually it's, does, it does seem kind of intuitive, doesn't it? Because if one of the, uh, if a, like a time T works, that means that the, uh, if a time t works, that means that you can always do t plus one because the configuration that you have for t would work for t plus one and et cetera. And if you don't have one for time t plus one, then of course you won't have one for t because if it's not even possible to do it in t plus one, how would we possibly do it with t? And t is a strictly, strictly more strict condition. So, um, no matter what, the monotonicity is conserved. And because there's monotonicity, then we can use binary search to do it on the answer. Um, yeah. Um, our last topic today is gonna be prefix sums. So um, prefix sums are essentially a way to sum all the numbers within a range. And you can do this by pre-computing a prefix sum, which is uh, the sum of all the, or the sum of the prefix of elements. And then you can find the sum of all the numbers in a range by finding the sum of the numbers in the, like in the prefix up to the right endpoint minus the sum of the numbers up to the left endpoint. And uh, that's, basically the way you can efficiently query the sum of all the numbers in a range. Um, you can also do prefix differences, like if the problem is giving you a bunch of range updates, like for example, if you had something like this, and then like this is your array, and then you have a bunch of queries like this. Uh, then this is like plus one, this is plus two, this is plus five, then you can basically uh, store a prefix difference array and you can update that. And the way you do that is your prefix difference array is originally zero and then you add one, so here's one. But then when you subtract one, it's negative one. So when the range ends, because when the range starts, um, that means that you're adding one to the uh, to the difference between that one that, that first index and the index before it, which is not being updated and then similarly on the other side you're adding one to the last index but not to the one afterwards so it's negative one from that to that and then you can have this thing and then afterwards after you're done with all of your updates, then you can figure out what the actual array is by doing a prefix sums on your prefix differences. Um, yeah, that's basically the idea on 1D prefix sums. 2D prefix sums are very similar, except 
it requires you to do a, uh, something called principle of inclusion and exclusion. It's essentially a fancy way of saying, well, count the number of times that you've included it. What do I mean by that? Well, essentially, with p sums i j, uh, you've included it. Uh, let's say this is your grid. With p sums i j, you want to include all of these once, right? But when you do i minus one, you're including all of these once. And then when you're doing j minus one, you're including all of these ones. But that means you're including these ones in this uh, first half or first box. Um, you're including these ones twice. So you have to subtract it back in order to maintain that all of them are one. Uh, all, all of them are counted once. And so this is basically the idea behind 2D prefix sums, where you can just uh, find the sum of all the values, and then um, here's the way you can do it. It's a similar, it's a similar way because you're finding, you're finding the range at the max, and then you're subtracting all of the ones you can. But then after you subtract all of those, some of them are subtracted twice, so you have to add that back. Um, but yeah, this is essentially the idea. Uh, Um, okay. Um, prefix sums generally is not an algorithm in terms of itself. It's a way to optimize your solutions to different things. Like a lot of problems, they'll mostly be prefix sums because that's the hardest part about it. But the idea is first, you want to figure out a solution which is not actually efficient and you want to optimize that solution with prefix sums. So if you can reduce the problem down to finding the sum of the numbers in a range or something like that, you can do prefix sums using it. However, prefix sums itself isn't a way to solve, a it's not an algorithm to solve a problem. It's rather an optimization to try to uh, make your algorithm faster. Um, let's see an example of this. Uh, here's practice problem one, which uh, I'll send it in chat. This is a relatively easy silver problem, so yeah. To, um, oh my, okay. The solution to this problem is basically to realize that there are only n different places for Bessie to change her gesture. That means that we can brute force through all of the possible patterns of gestures that she can because um, if you notice, her operations are going to look like this. There's one change, and then everything before it is going to be everything before it is going to be the same. So let's say X, and everything after it is going to be Y. And so if if everything before it is X, that means that we can just look at this. Um, we can look at this pattern of gestures, and then we can see that. We can see that the answer within here would just be, um, well, check this against X, check this against X, check this against X, check this against X. And then here we could check this against Y, this against Y, so on and so forth. However, when we check this, if we don't use prefix sums, this will run in O of N squared, right? So what we want to do is we want to do a prefix sum. So our array would look like one if X wins, zero if X loses, or zero if X doesn't win, and one, zero, one, dot, dot, dot. And then it'll go here, and then you want to find another suffix array, or a suffix sum, which it, or uh, kind of like a suffix sum, which is like one, zero, dot, dot, dot. And then you can find the sum of all of these, and then the sum of all of these. And after you pre-compute it, you can just figure out what the answer is at that point. Because, because you can figure out what the sum of the prefix sum at that point is. So prefix sum of i plus suffix sum of i. And um, 
makes sense to everyone, then why don't we work on a few practice problems? And uh, after like an hour or so, I'll go over a couple of those I think that are hard and are interesting to go over. Um, so here are the practice problems. Um, I'll send all the links to the chat later, like after I stop screen sharing. But um, yeah, um, this next hour or so is about free time for you guys to work on this problem, um, to ask me any questions that you have about the problems, to help me like go through all of the stuff. And also, if you wanted to know more about like more advanced silver algorithms, you can also ask me about that now. Um, yeah, so this is the problem, milk visits. Um, so, uh, wait. so basically you're given a tree. A tree is um, n-1 edges and it's connected, no cycles. And uh, so let's say your tree looks something like this. Each node is either G or H. So we can just randomly assign these nodes. Okay. And then Farmer John has M friends and each of the friends will go from one of the nodes to another node. So, um, Yeah, and they want a specific type of milk, either G or H. And so if they can't drink either G or H milk, that, or I mean, if they can't drink their preferred type of milk, they will be ha sad. And you want to figure out um, whether each friend will be happy. So the idea behind this problem is that, um, well, the first observation you notice is that what happens if a friend is not happy? If they're sad, like what happens? Well, in order for a friend to be sad, that means that each node on the path, each node must be the opposite of what it is. So the same type. So because each node has to be the same type in order for the, um, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because there are only two types, that means that each, um, each, uh, each path in which a farmer or farmer John's friend is sad means that the, all of the nodes along that path must be the same type, right? And it also must be the opposite of the type they want. So let's say they want uh, H. Then if you go from this node to this node, they would be sad because all of them are G. But if you go from this node to this node, then he'll be happy because he'll be able to drink milk from Holstein. Um, Holsteins. So the idea is to notice that they all have to be the same type. So in order for them to be the same type, they must be in the same connected component. So let's do this. Each edge is only valid if it goes between if it goes between two nodes of the same type. Now you basically want to check whether the two uh, the two endpoints are in the same component. If they're not in the same component, not in the same component, well, what does that mean? If they're not in the same component, that means that, um, well, both types of nodes are inside your path. And so if both types of nodes are inside your same path, then of course, answer equals to one. Answer is one. Otherwise, if they're in the same component, then you can check, check whether the type is the same.
And once you check whether the type is the same, if it is the same, then, um, so if it is the same, then, uh, then, or no, no, no. Yeah, if it is the same, then answer equals to one. Otherwise, answer equals to zero. So once you do this, then you can just run a flood fill to figure out what the connected components are. And then after you've run the flood fill, you can just check whether they're in the same component. And then uh, after you check whether they're in the same component, whether that component has the same type. And if, uh, and you can figure out the answer using this. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Um, okay, I guess that makes sense. Then. In this problem, essentially, you're given an array and you want to find the largest uh, range within this array. So you're given an array and you want to find the largest range within the array. Uh, uh, yeah, so... You were given an array, and you want to find the largest, um, the largest range within this array, such that the sum of all the numbers is divisible by seven. So the way you can solve this is you first want to figure out what the sum inside the range is, and you want to then figure out what the largest possible range is. Well, um, let's start with the first one: finding the sum within the range. You can use prefix sums for that. But specifically, you want to find the sum divis uh, sum modulo 7. Because if you find the sum modulo 7, then you can do some cool things about it. So if you have like your sum array, which is like random. So let's say this is your sum array. This is your array containing all of the sums modulo 7. Now, what can we do with this array if we um, if we want to find the maximum range within this array? Well, one thing we can do with this array is we can say, what is a property of something that is divisible by seven? Well, let's say that your range looks like this. How can we easily tell? Uh, how can we easily tell if this is divisible by seven? Well. If this is divisible by seven, that means that the uh, this number, so the p sum b minus p sum a minus one is congruent to zero mod seven. That means that p sum b is congruent to p sum a. Well, this really helps us because now we can uh, use the following algorithm to solve the problem. We find the prefix sum of the array, and then we go through the prefix sums for each individual type of prefix sum, and then we want to find what the uh, what the maximum what the difference between the maximum index and the minimum index is. So, for example, if our type is two, we want to find the difference between the maximum index and the minimum index. And that would be our answer for two. For six, it would be the maximum index minus the minimum index. And um, this works because you know that it's divisible by seven if their sums are different by a multiple of seven. And in this case, if their sums are different by zero exactly because our sums are modulo seven. So now that we've uh, done all of this modulo stuff, we can easily find the answer by just looking at numbers of the same, numbers that are the same. And because we can do that, we can find the answer. So our answer in this sample, I guess, would be 
or in the sample I'm giving, it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, it's the same. So it would be six, I think. Yeah, it would be six. Um, does that make sense? Um, okay. This is uh, a gold problem. It seems very scary and probably is, and it's also very, very long. But essentially, the idea behind the problem or what the problem's asking for is you basically have a grid and some of the squares are blocked off and you want to insert a robot. And that robot can move left, down, right, or north. And every copy of that robot will move the same way. And um, yeah, and every D hours, um, the robot will copy itself and create one at every, um, at north, one directly north of it, one directly west of it, one directly east of it, and one directly south of it. And then it'll still keep moving, and then it'll replicate until it'll replicate until um, it hits a rock. And once it hits a rock, then it'll shut down immediately. And um, you basically want to figure out, well, what is the number of uh, empty squares that could potentially at some point hold a rock? or hold a robot. So um, if you look at the sample, uh, the, first, the first sample test case, um, the robot could start at any of the positions where there's an S and it can move as long as it's within a square that isn't a rock. And um, it wants to count the number of cells that could potentially at some point hold a rock. So, um, yeah. So the idea behind this problem is that you want to, um, you want to find the, uh, so basically, you want to figure out where the robot can be at its final position. And the way you can do that is, um, the way you can, or not where it can be at the final position, but let's say the robot is of size X, then where can you put the robot so that it still can um, move and increase? Well, um, you can do that by uh, essentially looking at like where the rocks are, and you can do a DFS using the rocks or a BFS through the rocks, and then you can figure out where the robot can be. So for example, um, if the robot is of size one and you have like, uh, blah. like this, like the sample test case, um, so if the robot starts over here, then you can move this way and then it'll go like this, 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 but then it can't grow anymore. So what you want to basically do is you basically want to figure out, well, where can the robot be after one? Well, it can be like anywhere over here. And the way you can express this is you can essentially say, well, it can be over here, and we know that it can be over here because all of the uh, all of the rocks uh, are at least a Manhattan distance of D away. And Manhattan distance is essentially, um, if you don't know what Manhattan distance is, it's essentially this, the number of vertical and the number of horizontal you need to get to the rock. And um, no matter, uh, so, and basically, a rock, I mean, 
not a rock, a robot position works if the Manhattan distance between it and the nearest rock is D. So basically, you can use this idea like where you can put a robot uh, so, such that it doesn't crash into a rock. You can use this idea to form a map. And the map, or not, not like a map, but like kind of like um, where the robot can be based on its position and how long ago it started. Based, uh, you can do that by running a DFS or BFS, a multi-source BFS from each of the rocks. So you can basically, you want to find for each rock, for each, or for each position, find the minimum Manhattan distance from from a rock. After you do that, now you can just run a DFS or a BFS through the entire, through each starting point. So you start at each starting point and then you go through all of the possible points that it can go to. So it can go east, north, west, and south. After each point, you can keep track of how many, how many, how many, many iterations you've, uh, how much time, or I guess how, how much time, I guess. How much time and the position. And um, then you can, uh, after you keep track of how much time and the position you're at, then you can figure out, well, um, you can figure out uh, basically the maximum, maximum time where you can be at the position. You can be at position. And the reason you want to find the maximum time where you can be at that position um, is because if you find the maximum time that you can be at that position, that's when there are the most robots uh, on the board. And so that's when it reaches as far as it can reach. And so, um, if you place a robot, the middle robot over there, then uh, you can reach the most places. And so you want to find the maximum because you want to figure out which squares can be uh, can be occupied by a robot. And um, once you find the maximum time, again, you use another BFS to do this. Um, so you use a BFS to find this. You use a BFS to find this. And now that you find you found the maximum time where you can be at each position, now you can find uh, now you know the maximum number maximum Manhattan distance away at that position from the farthest robot. So now you can use another BFS, use another BFS, to find. Um, yeah, so you use another BFS to find the position of, uh, to find, basically to find all working positions. And the way you do this is you can basically store a BFS of the position and the number of the Manha total Manhattan distance from the closest available position, I guess. And um, basically you can store how much Manhattan distance you have left. And after you traverse an edge, you reduce that Manhattan distance you have left. And um, 
Yeah, so in summary, for each position, you want to find the maximum or minimum Manhattan distance from the rock so that you know how much time you have to get to that position. Then you want to find the maximum time to get to the position. And then um, after that, you use another BFS to find all of the working positions based on the maximum time you can get to the position. And what I mean by get to the position, I mean the center, center robot. I don't mean like any of the edge robots or anything like that. I mean the center robot because from the center robot and the time, you can calculate all of the available robot positions. So yeah, this was a very complicated problem and it uses a lot of steps of BFS, but hopefully I guess you have understood kind of the solution. Um,